Hello, Richard here. Welcome to part two of making a degaussing machine from the motor of an old food processor. And what we're going to be doing today, we're going to have a lot of fun today because we're going to be getting on the bench here and hooking this all up to the mains and uh, doing some measurements and some experimenting. And I want to sort of take you with me on a little bit of a journey of discovery as we sort of work out uh, how we're going to basically stop this thing from overheating and blowing up when we put some volts up it. Um, if you cast your mind back to part one of the video, we said that when you take a motor apart like this, if you just plug it into the mains and you put mains voltage across the uh, windings here, it's going to get really hot really quickly and possibly just catch fire, burn, blow fuses, and all kinds of nasty things like that. We don't want that. So what we need to do is we need to work out a way of limiting the current this, this thing's going to draw down to safe limits so it's not going to get too hot. And that's what today's video is all about. Now, there's a few things we're going to do with that. Now, first of all, I want to do some calculations. We're going to do a little bit of AC theory here. We're going to do some uh, equations for AC current. So don't worry, we won't get too far into that. But what we want to do is do a few calculations to see what we think this will do when we power it up. And then we're actually going to hook it all up to the mains and we're going to do some measurements and see what it actually draws in terms of current. So we'll know where we are in terms of how much current it's going to draw as it is. As we said in part one, there's a few ways you can limit the current in an AC circuit without getting into sort of semiconductors and thyristors and um, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, fundamentally, we've got resistance, capacitance and inductance as ways of limiting current. Now, we said before about using resistance to limit the current. and um, We'll have a go at that. We'll get a, a light bulb, which is basically a big 100 watt resistor, and we'll plug that in. And we'll see if that gives us enough current to power our magnetic field. Inductance, we can't really add an inductor in this to um, limit the current. That's just going to be way too big and clunky, and it's just not the way to do it. So we're going to look at capacitors for doing that. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to apply some power to the windings, and we'll work out what current they would draw as they are. I want to show you what happens as well when you put the rotor back into the circuit. So we'll, we'll get some current flowing through the windings, and we'll put the rotor in, and we'll measure how much current it draws with that in place, so you can actually get an idea of the effect of taking this out, as it were. Then what we're going to look at is putting a capacitor in series with this, which was the original plan. So we'll do some more sums. We'll work out what sort of current we should get by putting a capacitor in series with the windings. And again, we'll compare what we expect with our equations with what we actually get when we power it all up. Something else we want to know is the uh, there's the shape of the magnetic field. We want to be able to know where the field is strongest so we know where to put the thing we want to demagnetize. So we'll play around with some of this. This is magnetic viewing film. This is fun stuff. This actually will let us visualize the magnetic field of the, uh, the stator when it's powered up. So we'll have a play around with that, see what that gives us. And we're also going to have a bit of a play around with... Uh, this, this is a little homemade magnetic field sensor. So we'll use that to basically dabble around and work out where the magnetic fields are strongest. Uh, once we're happy and we got it all working, then we can take our nice 3D printed enclosure that we've uh, 3D printed up and we'll get it all mounted in that. And then we'll attempt to actually demagnetize the calipers. Right, so let's get started. Okay, so the first thing we want to know is if we just plug this straight into the mains, how much current would it draw and would it blow up? So to find that out, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate how much current we think it's going to draw. And then we're actually going to power it up and we're going to measure how much it actually draws. And we'll see how close we are with the, uh, the two results. We're going to have to take a few measurements before we can calculate anything. So what I'll do, I'll just do a quick diagram of what we're going to be measuring. And then we can take some measurements and then we can do the sums. Okay, so the circuit we're going to be looking at is going to be something like this. We're going to have our motor winding like that. And we've got two terminals. We're going to have a live and a neutral. And we're going to be putting 240 volts AC at 50 hertz because I'm in the UK. And we're going to be putting that 240 volts AC, 50 hertz current through this winding. And in order to calculate the current flowing through here, what we need to know is two things, because this is an AC circuit. We need to know the resistance of the winding, and we also need to know the inductance. Because it's an AC circuit, it doesn't only have resistance, it also has inductance, and the inductance actually has an effect on the current flow in the circuit. So we need to work out these two values. So we need to measure the resistance and measure the inductance, and then we can plug those into a formula and we can calculate the current flow. All right, so let's do that. 
Okay, so first off, we're going to measure the inductance of the winding. And for that, I've got a uh, LCR meter. This, These are amazing, actually. This is one I picked up off eBay. And I think it was about £15 UK, which is probably about $15, US, uh, including shipping. Um, so I don't know how they make them for the money, really. I mean, it's an LCR meter and uh, costs about the same as a pizza. So anyway, right, so we'll set this to, um, let's have a look. We'll set this to a 200 millihenry range. And then we'll use this to um, see if we can measure the inductance of our winding. So on there, we've got 38, 38.2, yeah, call it 38.2 millihenries. And we also need to know the resistance of the winding. So we'll use this meter again. We'll pop it over to the ohm socket and it's going to be very low this. Let's put it on the 20 ohms range because it's going to be a very low resistance there so we'll try that fluctuating around a little bit but i've got i'm going to call that 13.4 ohms okay so on with that information let's do some sums and see what current we think is going to flow through this Okay, so for R, we got a reading of 13.4 ohms. And for L, we got 38.2 millihenries of inductance. So the formula we want to use to work out the effective resistance or the, the, the AC resistance or impedance, as it would be known by, the equation for that would be Z, which is impedance, equals the square root of the resistance squared plus what's known as the inductive reactance squared. This will give us the Z, which is the effective, it's kind of like AC resistance. It's actually, it's impedance. It's not really resistance, but it helps to think of it that way sometimes. So we need to calculate XL, which is the inductive reactance. And there's a formula for that as well. So the formula for XL, XL equals 2 times pi times F, which is the frequency of the circuit, times the inductance. So with that, that would give us uh, equals 2 times pi times F times 0.038, because the inductance is in henries, so that's 38 millihenries, and 2 pi F, that's 2 times pi times f. Now, in the UK, the frequency is 50 hertz. So 2 times f would be 100. Pi, we'll call that 3.14. So that's 100 times 3.14. So that would give us 314 times 0.038. So let's work that out. And I'm approximating pi there, so we're not being too accurate with that. So 314 times 0.038. 38 that gives us 11.932 ohms and that is the inductive reactance it's not the resistance but it's the inductive reactance now that we have that we can plumb that into our previous formula if you remember we had impedance equals the square root of r squared plus xl squared so we'll work that into a formula z equals the square root of 13.4 squared plus 11.932 squared, which would equal square root of, let's do 13.4 squared is 179.56 and 11.932 squared, we'll do that, 11.932 squared is... 142.37 which gives us the root of 179.56 plus 142.37 is 321.93 so taking the square root of 321.93 so z equals that equals 17.94 ohms that's the impedance that's the most terrible ohm sign let me try again ohms 
So 17.94 ohms, that's the impedance of this circuit. Now from that, we can then use some basic ohms law and we can work out what current that would give us at 240 volts. So our Z equals 17.94 ohms and the current would equal voltage over resistance or we're going to do um, impedance in this case. So that would be 240 divided by 17.94, which equals 13.37 amps. So we'd expect if we plug this straight into the mains, it would draw a current of 13.37 amps, which is about as much as you can draw from a UK mains plug. UK mains plugs are fused at 13 amps. It wouldn't blow the fuse necessarily, but it's going to be right on the limits. And if we looked at that in terms of power, so P equals I times V, uh, that would give us 13.37 uh, times 240 would give us 3.2 kilowatts. That's not really in watts, that would actually be in VA, volts times amps. Um, but it gives you an idea of the immense power we'll be pulling from this small coil. It'd be the same as having like a, imagine the uh, most powerful electric heater you could have in your house. It would be equivalent to that in this tiny coil. So it's going to get really hot. Anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to put some power onto the circuit and actually measure and see if we get anything like 13.37 amps in real life. Okay, right. So before we start getting carried away and putting mains voltage onto all the things on the desk here, um, we'll have a quick talk about safety. Now, if you want to follow along with this video, then only do so if you're really confident of your own abilities to work with mains electricity. Mains power can be lethal. And if you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to get yourself into trouble with it. Now, for added safety, I'm using, I've got a mains isolation transformer here. And this basically takes um, 240 volt UK mains in one side and it gives out 240 volts UK mains on the output. The difference being that the output side is completely electrically isolated from the input side. I'm not going to go into details of mains isolation transformers because that's a whole video in its own right. Uh, but this basically lessens the risk of getting a severe shock if you should happen to touch something on this side of it. It doesn't eliminate the risk. It doesn't make it safe. It just reduces the risk of something really bad happening if something goes wrong. A mains isolation transformer gives us an element of safety. That then goes into this thing here, which is known as a, uh, a variac. The, the variac is a, vo it's a variable transformer. So there's a big knob on the top. And if you turn that, you can dial up a voltage from zero volts up to, uh, I think it goes up to 250 volts. And with that, we can adjust the mains output. So this plug here, this, the, uh, the white plug on the front, this can be given a variable mains voltage from zero volts up to 250 volts. That's really useful with this circuit because what we want to do is we don't want to just power this up and give it the full current because it'll probably catch fire. Um, so this allows us to slowly ramp the voltage up and we can monitor things. We've got various bits of test kit, which we'll go through in a minute, and we can monitor how this is doing and we can actually measure the current. Now, like I said, I don't want to put 240 volts on this because I think it would be a bad idea. So what we can do with the Variac is we can basically wind up the voltage to say 120 volts, about halfway, measure the current. We're going to be using a clamp meter to measure the, uh, the current. And when we've measured the current at 120 volts, assuming that the voltage and current have a linear relationship, in other words, if you double the voltage, you double the current. If that's the case, then we can just basically turn the voltage up halfway and then double what we measure for the current, and that should equal what we calculated. That's the theory, so let's get it wired up and powered up, and then uh, see how close we were. All right, well, I've got everything hooked up. Now, what we've got is the, the mains from the Variac comes in here, and the neutral goes into one side of the winding, and the other side of the winding comes out through this chop block onto the capacitor. Now, ignore the, this is a capacitor here. Just ignore that, it's not actually used. I've just got basically these two terminals are on one terminal of the capacitor. So we'll look at the capacitor later on, but at the moment it's not in the circuit. It's just basically connecting these two wires together for convenience. And so the orange wire comes onto this terminal, back out of the terminal and into the mains here. We've got the Variac plugged in. I've got a AC clamp meter here. This is basically gonna measure the current. So the current is gonna flow through this live wire here, through the clamp meter, and this is going to give us a readout of how much current is actually flowing and we can use that to measure how much current we get. What I'm going to do, I'm going to power up the circuit in a second, we'll wind it up from 0 to 120 volts 
What I'll do as well is I'll get this uh, temperature sensor and we can actually measure the uh, the temperature of the windings and we can keep an eye on how hot they're getting. So hopefully you can see that on the camera there. Right, so we'll wind it up to 120 volts, measure the current, see what the temperature looks like it's doing, and then we'll switch it off and compare notes. Okay, so at zero volts, you can see we've got uh, zero volts here on the very axis. You'll be able to read off the, uh, the mains voltage we're at here. We've got the current flowing on the clamp meter here, and you can see the temperature on the little temperature gauge there. And as I say, hopefully you can get that in view without any reflections on it, hopefully. Right, so we'll just start winding the voltage up gradually, and you'll be able to see that on the camera. And so we're at 25 volts, 30 volts, you can see the current starting to rise. And take it up to 40 volts, 50, 60, 70, 80. Uh, temperature is rising a little bit on the coils. So we're at 106. I'm just going to take it up to the 120 and then we can sort of keep an eye on it. So 121 volts. We've got 5.4 amps and the temperature is now up to 65 degrees, 67, 70. So you can see the coil's getting quite hot now, 75 degrees, and we'll turn it off. So, okay, with that, we got up to about 5.1 amps. That was at 120 volts. So if we doubled that up, that would take us to about 10.2 amps, which is lower than what we anticipate. We worked out about 13.3, and this looks like it's going to be more like 10.2. But even so, that's still quite a lot of current, and you can see that the temperature quite rapidly rose to um, about 75, uh, heading towards 80 degrees on the uh, windings, which is getting quite hot quite quickly. That's not enough time to be able to demagnetize something. Now, I said before it would be interesting to see what happens if we actually put the rotor back into the, the stator winding. So we can do that now. We can uh, pop this back into the, uh, the stator. Let me just do that, make sure it's not too hot. It's warm though, you can feel it's, it has got quite warm. So I'm just going to pop the, the rotor back in temporarily. And this isn't going to spin around. It's, uh, it can't actually start. For, for one thing, it doesn't have any bearings. And for another thing, it just won't, it needs extra circuitry to be able to actually rotate, but it'll probably buzz quite healthily. Um, but what we'll do, we've got this set up with 120 volts already. So we'll fire this up and then we'll see what sort of current we get with the rotor. And you should see the current is significantly lower with the rotor because it's providing a kind of, um, think of it like providing a sort of a load on the circuit for the circuit to work on. And it's affecting, it's basically affecting the overall impedance of the circuit. It's going to increase the impedance and and decrease the current so let's let's power it up and see what happens keep an eye on the current meter so yeah they we're getting 3.2 amps now instead of about 5.2 so you can see the current is significantly less with that in circuit and i'm just going to measure the temperature of the windings now they're probably going to be warming up still i don't know if you, I don't know if you can see that there. let me get a bit further over this way so we're getting about sort of 40 degrees. It's not actually heating up now. Let's check somewhere else, 52. So with the rotor in, you can see it's just not overheating. It's actually balanced more. And if the rotor, let me turn it off. It's quite noisy. If the rotor did actually spin up, then the current would drop then again. That's basically how the, uh, the start switch on the start capacitor works. Um, when you switch the motor on, there's a big current which engages the uh, start relay. And then when the motor spins, the current drops down further and the relay drops out and switches out the um, start capacitor. All right, so let's remove that now because we don't need that anymore. We mentioned in the first part of the video that another way that you can uh, limit the current on a circuit is to put a resistance in series with the, the windings. And uh, given the amount of power this thing's drawing, that's really not practical. You know, you'd need a really high power resistor uh, you're talking probably 500 watt resistor, which is going to cost you sort of 40, 50 pounds, 40, 50 dollars to buy. And it's going to get really hot. It's a really inefficient way of, of um, limiting the current to the windings. Um, but a form of resistor is a light bulb. So what we're going to do is we're just going to put this 100 watt light bulb in series with the winding. And uh, we'll see what effect that has on the current. All right, so now what we've got, we've got a light bulb in the circuit. So basically the mains comes in here and goes through the light bulb, through our clamp meter, 
through the windings and back to neutral. Let me just do you a quick diagram of that. Okay, so now the circuit we've got is we've got our live terminal and that comes in and we've got a light bulb in the circuit in series and then we've got our windings here and then we've got our neutral. Now the light bulb has a resistance to it, call that resistance of the light bulb and then we've got the resistance of the winding like we had before and we've got the inductance of the winding LW. What happens is when you put the light bulb in series or you put a resistor in series, uh, Kirchhoff's law says that the current in every node on a circuit is the same. So in other words, if you measured the current here, it would be the same as the current here, the same as the current here, same as the current here, and so on. So basically putting the, uh, the light bulb, and we know that if you put a 100 watt light bulb across the mains, it just lights up and it's safe. And whatever current the light bulb would allow through it would be the same as it would allow through the winding. So if you have the current here of I, you would have exactly the same current here of I. So the light bulb forms a current limiter for the windings. So let's plug it in and have a look and see what we get. All right, so we've got the Variac on zero. I'm just going to wind it up to 240 volts. And then you can keep an eye on the current meter here and see what current we get. So... As we wind it up, you see the light bulb start to light up. And we're just around 89, 90 volts, 100 volts. And we'll just keep going. We can take this all the way up to 240 volts. And the light bulb gets brighter and brighter. We're up to 220, 230 volts. 239, that's close enough. And you can see basically there's no current showing here at all. There's just zero current. There's, there's not enough current to measure. And if we uh, have a look at the temperature on here, you probably can't see that because of the glare of the bulb, but that is, um, it's about 33, 34. It's not going to be getting hot. Um, in fact, if I get the screwdriver and just touch it on the core inside, there's the most sort of vague of, I don't know if you can hear that on the microphone. It's the most vague sort of magnetic field going on. And again, we'll just measure the, uh, the windings and there's no current, um, there's no temperature increase on those. So the light bulb would kind of work to limit the current, but it would limit it too much. It wouldn't allow enough current through to do what we want to do. Um, one trick we can do though, because we can't see the current there, we'll try another little trick to see if we can actually increase um, the sensitivity of our clamp meter. Okay, what I've done this time, I've actually got um, four windings around the clamp meter. Rather than the wires going through the clamp, we've got one, two, three, four windings there, I believe it is. So what that'll do is that'll give us four times the uh, indicated current in theory. So if we turn it on now. So now you can see, I don't know if you can see that. It's probably a lot of glare off the lights. Um, how about that? We're getting 1.2 amps, it's showing us. So if we divide that by four, um, that'll be 0.3 amps. So um, 300 milliamps we're getting through this circuit like that. So clearly that's not enough to um, give us enough current to actually create a big enough magnetic field. But anyway, interesting little experiment there. Now you could, I suppose in theory, you could put four or five hundred watt light bulbs in parallel, which would give you more current, but it's getting a bit unwieldy then if you've got like 500 watts of lighting just to demagnetize a little um drill bit you know there's there's a there's a more elegant way to do it um and it's in the form of one of these so next up we're going to have a look at putting a capacitor in the circuit we'll put a capacitor in series and again we'll do some maths we'll do a few sums to work out what current we think we should get with the capacitor and i'll show you those in a moment and uh and then we'll actually hook it all up and see what we get all right, well, as always, let's uh, begin with a diagram. So we've got our live coming into the circuit. Next, we're gonna have a capacitor in series. Then we've got the winding of the stator. And then we've got our neutral terminal. So now in the circuit, we've got three elements. We've got a capacitor and we've got resistance and we've got inductance. Now we've already worked out that the resistance is 13.4 ohms. And the inductance, or rather, let's say that we worked out that the inductive reactance, XL, which is the sort of impedance due to induction, 
that was um, 11.93 ohms. So in order to work out the overall impedance of the circuit, we also need to know what XC is, which is the capacitive reactant. Um, now XC, that's given by the formula XC equals 1 divided by 2 pi FC. So similar to the uh, XL equals 2 pi FL, but this time it's 1 over 2 pi FC. So if we plug our values into that, we get XC equals 1 over, and we said 2 pi F is equal to 314. So that's 2 times 50 is 100, times 3.14 is 314. And C, in our case, I'm going to be using a 25 microfarad capacitor. So C is going to be 0 0.0000025. Three hundred and fourteen times point four zeros and two five gives us one over naught point naught naught seven eight five, and that gives us if we take the reciprocal of that, that gives us a hundred and twenty seven point three eight ohms. That's the capacitive reactance of the uh, capacitor in the circuit. So what we can do is we can plug that back in up here and we will have our three values so xc is 127.38 so straight away you can see that of the three impedances that we have the capacitive uh, impedance or the capacitive reactance is the largest uh, 10 times more than the others. So the capacitor is going to have a big impact on the uh, current flowing through the circuit. Now, what we want to do is we want to basically get the uh, the overalls, a Z total for the circuit. And there's a formula we can use, which will basically combine all these values together. And that is Z equals the square root of R squared plus XL minus xc brackets squared and that will give us z the uh, total impedance of the circuit so let's have a look at that if we plug our values in so z equals the square root of 13.4 squared plus 11.93 minus 127.38 all squared which equals square root of, and let's just do the maths on those. So that's 179.56 plus, and we'll do 11.93 minus 127.38. Square that, and we get 13,328.7. So you can see what a big effect this uh impedance of the uh, capacitors having on this equation and if we then work out what that is that's the square root of 13,508.26 which is 116.22 ohms so that's our impedance that's our total impedance for the circuit if we plug that into some ohms law to find the current so as we said i equals v over r which equals 240 divided by 116.22 that gives us a total current of 2.06 amps so let's just call that two amps so we would expect with the capacitor in the circuit as we had above that the, the current flowing through the winding will end up being about two amps at 240 volts so let's uh, connect up the capacitor put some power on it and see what we get okay so we've calculated that with a 25 microfarad capacitor in series with the uh, winding we should get two amps at 240 volts so let's test that out we've got our current meter ready to go and power up the transformer got the variac on zero so what we'll do is we'll bring the variac up um, to 240 volts assuming our calculations are correct and we'll keep an eye on the current 
We'll keep an eye on the temperature as well and we'll see where we end up, see how accurate we were with our calculations. So let's go. So we're over 100 volts and 120 volts, we've got 0.7 amps showing. So we'll keep going, it's certainly limiting the current. 150 volts, we're at an amp. Temperature is about 24 degrees, 25 degrees. And we're up to 180 volts, 1.4 amps at 200 volts. Temperature. 26 degrees and much more controlled now so let's just take it up to 240 ish 241 and we got 1.7 amps showing on the uh, current it's a little bit low a little bit lower than what we uh, calculated and on the temperature we're about 28 degrees 29 degrees so we're generating a little bit of heat in the coils i'm just going to get the screwdriver actually and uh, see what sort of uh, buzz we get here oh yeah we're certainly getting some uh, magnetism in there compared with when we just had the bulb connected. Uh, temperature wise, 33 degrees. Scan around a little bit. So yeah, we're about 30 degrees or so. 33 degrees. So that's quite reasonable. That seems to be holding its temperature quite well. It's not overheating. As I say, we're pulling about 1.7 amps, which is maybe a little bit low. Um, so maybe we could have gone with a different size of capacitor. Let me just shut things down for a second. On the subject of capacitors, right, first of all, safety first, let me just discharge this capacitor because it's had mains across it. So there's always a possibility that it will be holding a charge. If we turned it off while the, um, at the sort of top half of the AC cycle, this could still be holding a high voltage. So I've got a 10K 5 watt resistor and I'm just going to, short that across there just to remove any charge that may be lurking in the capacitor these can be very dangerous so uh you don't certainly don't want to be touching the terminals or capacitor unless you've actually discharged it um we've got a couple of others here they're already discharged but we'll just uh give them a touch anyway the reason i'm using a resistor and not just shorting the terminals with a pair of pliers which you could do is this is just a more controlled way of doing it you know this is not going to result in a big flash and spot welding the pliers onto the terminals. Now, it's not going to risk damaging the electronics components either. It just means it's going to take a little longer to actually discharge the capacitor, but only seconds really. So anyway, right. So on the subject of capacitors, this was the original capacitor that um, came with the uh, the motor. This was the uh, start capacitor and it's a 40 microfarad, 280 volt. And um, I don't know how well you can see that here, but you can see it's actually got a bit of a bulge to it. This is a brand new start capacitor and it's very parallel. Let me see how close I can get you onto that. See if you can still focus, hopefully. Um, and you can see here as well, I don't know if you can pick that up, but you can see that the terminals are kind of bowed out. They're sort of, you know, they've gone that way. And what happened when I was first playing around with this, I was the idea was I was going to use a start capacitor from the motor as a current limiter. Now, there's a couple of things. First of all, um, that should be doable because we're not going to have this running for long. You know, we, we're only going to be demagnetizing for really a few seconds, I guess, you know. So the start capacitor should have survived that. But what I found was this actually started getting really hot. This got up to about 90 degrees and uh, I could smell things getting very hot. Thinking it was the winding. I thought the windings were starting to overheat, but it wasn't. It was this. Um, and it started to sort of bow and uh, ex expand. Now, it, as it is, start capacitors aren't designed to be continuously in the circuit. They're only designed to run briefly to start the motor and then be switched off. That said, I did actually try this capacitor, and this is again, it's just a start capacitor, and this ran fine. I, this, I, you know, this was on for quite a few minutes. It didn't even break a sweat. So I think, to be honest, this was actually on its way out. I think this was um, it's an old capacitor. It was probably on its way out. Running it the way I was just sent it over the edge. However. If you're going to, um, let me just quickly disconnect this. If you're going to do this yourself, then what I would recommend you do is actually buy a run capacitor. 
And run capacitors, you can see straight away the difference in the construction. Uh, run capacitors are actually designed to run continually. So these have no problem at all just being permanently full-time in the circuit. And um, using one of these, you're not going to have any problems at all. Uh, so you should be all right with one of these. I mean, we're only using this device briefly. So if you've got one of these with the motor, try it out. If it works, all well and good. I had the chance to buy one of these. It costs about seven UK pounds, I think, for one of these. They're not mega expensive, probably equivalent seven dollars or so in the states. So yeah, difference. There's a difference between a start capacitor and a run capacitor. So I'm going with a run capacitor. Right. So we've got a, a setup that works. Now we've got a capacitor that limits the current here to just under two amps little bit on the lean side but it'll probably do it'll probably be enough for what we want to do what we're going to do now we're going to take a look at the actual shape of the magnetic field we're going to have a look using our magnetic viewing film uh, this is really neat stuff basically it's a, it's a magnetically impregnated film and if you put it over a magnetic field it'll actually show you the shape of the field you know in the old days you'd get like a piece of cardboard and you sprinkle it with iron filings and iron filings would follow the flux lines and show you the shape of the magnetic field well this kind of does the same but without having to get everything covered in iron filings which is always a bonus in my book um right so what we'll do is we'll put this on top and then we'll power it up now it's set to 240 volts i'm happy now that it's not going to burn out or anything so we can run it at full voltage and just have a look at this when i switch it on let's put the mains on and when I switch on the Variac, just keep an eye on the uh, magnetic viewing film and you should see the actual shape of the magnetic field when we do. There we go, isn't that awesome? So, you can see here the, um, the shape of the windings. We've got the windings around the edge. These are where the four coils are. There's coils all the way around, but remember some of them are actually the start windings. I'm just going to turn that off again because I don't want to overheat it and melt the film i don't want to melt the film by the thing overheating and it'll hold the image of the magnetic field anyway so you can see that there's a pattern emerging here now where the lines are brightest is where the flux is potentially the strongest but it's also potentially where we've got a, a permanent pole what i mean is the whole point of this the whole point of demagnetizing is we need an alternating magnetic field we need it we need the magnetic field going north south north south 50 times a second if we have a static magnetic field then that's going to show up as a thick line here or a, as a bright line here so the bright lines here sort of imply that we've got a, a north or a south it's not alternating if it was alternating then you wouldn't get any change on here because it's not one thing or the other so this is basically saying you'd imagine that when you demagnetize something you'd put it down the center of this hole but that's probably not necessarily the best place to put it. When you think about it, the, the magnetic field isn't necessarily strongest there. And we want to put whatever we're demagnetizing in the strongest field. We, you know, we don't really care about what current we've got or what voltage or, or what temperature or anything like that. We just care that we've got a strong enough magnetic field to demagnetize the thing that we want to demagnetize. So this is saying that basically where these lines are is probably not the best place to be putting your drill bit or your calipers or your screwdriver that you want to demagnetize. In saying that, what we want to do is sort of have a look at and see where the magnetic field is actually the strongest. So to do that, what we've got is this little device here. So I made up this little, uh, I don't know if you can see that there. We've got this little, um, got this little uh, coil, I wound a coil of uh, enameled speaker wire onto a piece of plastic. And what this should do is we can put this into the magnetic field and then we can move it around and we've got some terminals here if we measure the current that's generated in here this will tell us where in this um stator that'll tell us whereabouts in here the alternating magnetic field is the strongest and bear in mind we need the strongest alternating field if we just have a static north pole or a south pole that's just going to magnetize the thing we want to demagnetize so this will only pick up alternating magnetic fields so what we'll do is we'll wire this into a, a meter that can read milliamps or pro probably microamps and then we can move it around and we can work out roughly what position we're going to get the strongest signal we don't really care what the signal is we don't care what the actual measurement is we're not trying to measure um, anything in any units we just want to work out where the strongest place is so let me just wire that up all right so i've got a little meter here uh, let me see. I don't think you can see the screen on that. Let me see if I can hold that somewhere where you can see it. 
And then what we're going to do is we're just going to put this into the magnetic field and you should see a current induced as we move this around. So in that position there, we're getting about 20 microamps and then we move towards the middle. You can see it drops off to zero as was sort of shown on the, uh, the magnetic imaging film. So if we come back to the edge again, this is sort of right close to one of the windings and you can see there's a black mark on these windings. I'll sort of put a black Sharpie mark on, on these. These are the main windings here. The ones in between are the uh, start windings. So if we're right next to one of these windings, oops, there we go. Let me make sure you can see the, uh, the reading there. So you can see we get about 20, milli, 20 microamps. If I move around to where the other windings are, you see it tails off again down to about three. So this is telling us that we want to be sort of right close to this winding. This one, Any one of these four windings, as long as we get close to those, we're getting the maximum magnetic flux. And if we move inside, we get less. So we're getting most right on this bundle of winding here. And we're getting less of a magnetic field on the inside. And as we move around, if I move, say, if we move into the middle, we're getting nothing and then we move towards the edges, it increases. So we're going to get the maximum alternating magnetic field right about here. So when we come to put this in, in an enclosure later, what I've done, I'll just show you actually, on the, um, on the front panel of the enclosure, you can see we've got these little winding icons, four winding icons. So these are in the enclosure so that when it's all put together, I'll know where the strongest magnetic field is because it'll be basically close to this. So that's that's the theory there. Okay, well, that's enough science and enough theorizing. So let's see if we can actually demagnetize a magnetic drill bit. Now, this has been living right next to a really strong permanent magnet for quite some time. And if I get my trusty box of uh, steel shavings, you can see that that's, uh, that's very, very magnetic indeed. So let's see if we can demagnetize this with our newly made degausser. Let's move some of this out of the way. And what I'll do, I'm just gonna hold, the, uh, hold this with some pliers. We'll power it up. And to demagnetize, what you need to do is you need to put the item into an alternating magnetic field. And degaussing is done with by use of a reducing alternating magnetic field. So in other words, you need a magnetic field that's flipping between north and south really quickly, and you need to put the thing in that uh, alternating field and then reduce the field gradually. So to do the reduction, what we're basically going to do is put it in the field, and then we're just going to slowly move it away from the field, and that's going to be reducing the strength and hopefully demagnetizing. So let's give it a go. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to put it in, I'm going to, it's probably going to touch the sides and make a noise, and I can really feel it vibrating, so it's probably going to hit the sides and make a horrible noise occasionally, but let's put it in as close to this edge as we can. And then we'll slowly take it out. It's impossible not to touch it, it kind of locks onto the uh, iron core. And then we'll slowly move it away. And we probably need to move it quite a distance just to make sure that uh, we're fully free from the effects of the magnetic field. So, let's see if that's made any difference at all. Well, there you go. Great success, I would call that. So that is now not magnetic. It's not holding chips anymore that drill bit would no longer be annoying in my lathe because it wouldn't just be covered in all kinds of like uh, metallic fluff. So that is, is a result, first time, there we go. All right, so what we'll do now, before we go and sort of try the end game of the uh, demagnetizing of my calipers, is we'll actually build this into its box. Got a nice little unit here. Um, We'll get it built into its final enclosure, get it all wired up, and then we'll give it a test drive from there. Incidentally, this is um this is 3D printed, and um this component on its own was a 20-hour print job. It took 20 hours to print that. And it got 
about 14 hours into printing. So it's printed this way up on the printer, printed up like that. And it got to this, you can see there's a band here where things have been going on. Um, yeah, and the extruder motor blew on the printer. My printer broke at that point. So 14, 15 hours in, it broke. So rather than just bin the whole thing and had to reprint another one, because filament's not cheap, you know, this is quite expensive filament. Um, and the electricity's not cheap either, you know, and the time's not cheap, whatever. Um, what I did is I got the model back in the CAD program. I basically cut off the bit that, or sliced it in two where it had finished printing. Then I just printed the top bit and then uh, super glued it back together. And it's done the job, really. It's actually um, quite, quite firmly together. Just sanded the outsides and we got the front plate to go on. So, yeah, we'll build this into a box and then uh, give it a test, final test, and see how we get on. Okay, so here we are with the finished degaussing machine, the Degaussomatic 5000, and here are my calipers, and these are the ones that got magnetized, and they pick up nasty little bits of metal. So, let's put it to the acid test, let's see if this will actually degauss a pair of calipers. So let's turn it on, and I guess the best way is really just going to be to get them in here. I can actually feel the magnetic field on them now. I feel them vibrating slightly. So I'm just going to put them on there and gradually draw them away slowly. Keep going so we're well clear of the magnetic field. All right. Let's see if that's made any difference. They're, that's definitely better. No, it's still picking up a little bit. Let's give them another go. Bring them out a bit more slowly this time. few tiny little bits on there still, but hardly anything compared with what it was. So yeah, there we go. I'm going to call that a success. That's certainly better than it was. It might benefit from a few more trips through the, uh, through the machine, but there we go. So um, last thing to do after I finish the video is work out why I've got an on-off switch, which is lit in both positions. But there we go. That's electricity for you. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. And until next time, thanks for watching.